Are the bulls in charge? We look at the data. Plus, Australia reveals crypto regulation plans, and the media is putting Tether under the spotlight. Welcome back to Real Vision Crypto Daily Briefing. I'm Ash Bennington. I'll discuss all this and more with digital asset manager Chris Sullivan. Chris, welcome back to the show. It's really a pleasure to have you here again. Yeah, thanks for having me. Before we get into the interview, let's take a look at our latest price analysis. Once again, this week, we start with important macro data. The latest U.S. job numbers smashed expectations. The U.S. economy added 517,000 non-farm payroll jobs in January. That's far more than analysts had expected. The unemployment rate fell to 3.4 percent. That's the lowest since, listen to this, 1969. Bitcoin and other major cryptocurrencies are largely shrugging off the news, according to data from Glassnode analyzed by Coindesk. Before the jobs report, Bitcoin markets sentiment hit its highest level in 14 months. That was during the latter stages of the 2021 bull market. For reference, for those of you who have been watching Real Vision Crypto since then, that's based on analyzing the funding rates for Bitcoin futures contracts. So it's a calculation that they use uh, to get sentiment on that. The best performers today, somewhat surprising. Terra Classic is among them. Ethereum POW was there earlier today too, but it dropped out precipitously, very much a legacy token, uh, and that's probably putting it politely. Finally, Coinbase is stock is up on the day again today. Uh, it's been on a tear since the start of the year, up 150% year to date. The latest gains come after the company won the dismissal of a lawsuit. It was brought by consumers alleging Coinbase facilitated the sale of unregistered securities on its platform. Uh, now, before I speak to Chris, a quick word about our sponsors. This episode of Crypto Daily Briefing is sponsored by the Crypto App. The Crypto App delivers everything you need to stay on top of the world of crypto and own your own and your own crypto holdings. It includes a market leading price tracker, portfolio manager, analytic suite and news feed, as well as a wide variety of customizable alerts and widgets. Crypto moves fast, so don't get left behind with over 4 million downloads. The crypto app is the market leading app for all things crypto. With that said, let's bring in our guest. Chris Sullivan is co-founder and portfolio co-manager at Hyperion Des Decimus. Great to have you with us again, Chris. Thank you, Ash. Wonderful to be here. Well, Chris, we got a lot of news flow here uh, today to talk about lots going on and very much want to get your opinion on these markets. Let's just talk about our first news story here. A Coindesk analysis shows crypto startups raised only $550 million in January 2023. That's a 91% drop compared to January 2022. The number of transactions also fell from 166 to 62. Coindesk also says most of the deals this year were for smaller, early stage crypto companies. The news outlet says this is a lagging indicator, so the full extent of the FTX fallout may not be known for some time. Chris, in the price analysis, we heard that Bitcoin market sentiment is at its highest since the bull market of 2021. So we've got somewhat conflicting data here. What's your take on this market? Are the bulls in charge now or not? I think the stage is set for the bulls to become in charge, right? Like this is the first impulsive rally we've had really in almost a year. We had a pretty good intermediate rally from July, August, but it was choppy overlap overlapping, not very clean, not very impulsive. Also, volume didn't really confirm the breakouts that occurred at, at minor degrees. So I think here we've got an objective evidence more on the bullish side than, than the bearish side at this time. Yeah. Chris, by the way, you obviously, for viewers of this platform, as they already know, are a passionate believer in cryptocurrency from a philosophical perspective. Talk a little bit, though, about what you guys do, because obviously, while you're philosophically quite long, tactically, you could be long or short. Tell us a little bit about what happens at Hyperion Decimus, what you guys do there. Yeah, our, our multi-strat is kind of designed to be an all-weather fund. It is quant-driven in both the macro model, which kind of adjusts the, the gross notional beta that we have on, as well as the different algorithms, whether HFT or, or, or market neutral, et cetera. But the whole purpose of any of the hedging options or, or algorithms is to build larger positions in the underlying, right? For example, if, if I was down 30% for 2022, but I have 30% more Bitcoin and Ethereum, am I down? Right. So the goal is is to fulfill kind of a mandate for those who want to be in digital assets long term, who look at the space in a diversified way, want people like us hunting alpha, whether it be running validator nodes, whether it be market making and options, all of the above in the aggregate for building larger positions in great protocols. 
And so it's interesting. You're obviously secularly long on the space, and yet right. tactically you can adjust uh, depending upon what the data tells you on a, on, a, on a much shorter time horizon, I guess it's fair to say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Chris, here's another story that's uh, one that just never seems to go away. The Wall Street Journal has done extensive research on the ownership uh, structure of Tether Holdings. That's the company behind Tether or USDT. It's the largest stable coin in the world, of course, with a market cap of some $68 billion. It's traded even more than Bitcoin if you look at the uh, volume of that mm -hmm. coin. According to documents dating back to 2018 seen by the Wall Street Journal, just four men with little past financial experience, according to the journal, owned 86% of Tether Holdings. That includes the CEO, the general counsel, and the chief financial officer, so obviously senior managers there. All three also perform the same roles at the crypto exchange Bitfinex. Separately, the chief compliance officer and chief technology officer also are shared by Tether and Bitfinex. Uh, the fourth Tether owner is a British Thai businessman. There's no response from Tether Holdings yet to this story. Chris, is this one that you follow? And if so, what's your take? Yeah, I mean, we, we pay attention to it because you know, there there could be some sort of macro prudential risk associated with Tether or or really to a large degree, any stable coin, right? But then we- By the way, define that for people who may not know. What is macro prudential risk and what's its broader potential to impact the crypto markets? Ba basically, it's a fancy word for super systemic, right? right. Where here we have roughly 200-ish billion in stable coin exposure. A lot of that is in Tether that in one sense can act as firepower on the buy side for any native tokens, uh, for example, or can act as some sort of systemic exodus from the space or, or entrapment, right? So we look at that because we have to pay attention to it, have to underwrite it to the best of our ability. We, we have done underwriting uh, significantly and, and update that annually um, on Tether. But, you know, it's there. there is a certain opacity that makes anybody uncomfortable, but we also are fully aware that why the regulators and central banks dislike this and even retail commercial banks is that this is absolutely in effect euro dollar deposits and what what is that that's us denominated deposits in non us banks right that's the definition so they can't control um the outcome so to speak through currency and monetary policy in the same way they can in the us so that that's why there's a dis distaste there that being said it would be wonderful if you know some of the folks were a lot more transparent on the side, whether it be Tether or USDC, right? One of the things I always enjoy about having you on the show is that your background in depth on the traditional capital markets, what folks in crypto call TradFi, and the ability to make those metaphors, like for example, euro dollar deposits uh, that have that kind of offshore unregulatable function here in the United States. Uh, that's certainly the perspective from the banking sector. But I'm curious, Chris, from a philosophical perspective, one of the things that uh, folks uh, in the space, maybe passionate Bitcoiners uh, and others, uh, in stable coins in general, I don't want to pick on Tether here, uh, that they find them problematic because they're highly centralized in their view. Is that a concern that you express as well? Yeah, I mean, we don't, re Bitcoin's a stable coin, ladies and gentlemen. Like, that's what it was built for. It is the ultimate trust asset, the ultimate collateral asset, the ultimate embodiment of property rights and code. So let, let me say that as a, a Bitcoin fan. But um, the reality of it is, is that the, the risk is both one from a tech perspective, you, you're kind of duplicating the banking risk, right? So Tether and USDC et al. Ought, ought to have treasury deposits of at least G7 currencies backing up, call it 70 to 90% of the, the float of the, the token. That's a reasonable range of expectation of liquid instruments to have lit, literally backing this. Now, let's also shine the light on that. How much more is that than the banks, commercial banks have on deposit, right? So if Tether's backed 70, right, let's go on the low end, what's my and your money backed at the bank? Uh, it's it's significant. 1.77%, Ash. Hmm. I was teeing so, that up for you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you, you just got to look at both the subjective and objective. And, and you know, if you're scared or it but here's the thing, Chris. Let me let me I'll, let me play devil's advocate here. One of the challenges mm -hmm. that we've seen in the crypto space uh, is that you know you you have this this what I've called the worst of all possible worlds phenomenon, where you have things that are centralized, centralized right. entities, whether it's FTX uh, or um, you know Voyager or um, you know BlockFi. Pick pick your poison in terms of bankrupt funds, uh, and and 
high centralization and a lack of regulation. So when I when Real Vision deposits my, my paycheck in my retail big brand uh, name brand bank, uh, I know that they're regulated. I know. I mean, I'm I'm not naive. I was here for the 2007 2008 financial crisis, uh, but depositors uh, did not lose money. They were backed by FDIC. I don't spend a whole lot of time worrying about that myself. But, but, go ahead. Sorry, Ash. Depositors lost a shit ton of money. You know how? The bailouts. Right. But those the, those losses for, for worse or better, many would argue for worse, were, of course, socialized across the entire tax base. The, the point is, right. if you're a, if you're a, if you're a, a, a working man or woman, you know, you go into work uh, as a registered nurse or whatever it is you do when your direct deposit hits, you don't worry that J.P. Morgan is not going to be able to meet those obligations. Right. For the most part. I know you do, Chris, but most people <laughs> I know you see my face. Most people um, don't you know, you're right. Um, I, I'm just kind of delineating the, yeah. the facts, right? And personally, do, do I use stable coins? No. Like I said, Bitcoin is a stable coin. Um, so I, I, I'm a critic vocally for them because in a sense, it kind of perpetuates the fiat system, right? But a, as a realist in terms of on and off ramps, they, they have been a beneficial thing for both money in money out as well as as DeFi space so it's not like you can just go poof crypto can right. fix and replace everything right it, it's getting to the point where it's got the infrastructure to potentially do that right but you, you've got to expand the ecosystem we just went over a trillion you got to get to 15 before it can take on the retail commercial banks at Let least let me ask you this question in a different way. I, I mean, I think you, you're wearing that fantastic T-shirt. I think a lot of uh, folks on our uh, who are watching this show share your libertarian sentiments about uh, about free markets and about freedom more generally. Uh, but I'm but I'm curious when when someone makes the argument, hey, look, I don't have and uh, you know middle of the road position here, mm -hmm. right? You know, listen, I don't have anything against stable coins, but if they're going to serve a banking function, they should be regulated like a bank. That's an argument that we hear out there. How do you feel about that? I, I agree. I think anything dealing with the central bank issued currency, uh, you know, any of the G20, for example, should fall under normal FX regulations. Mm. It, at least that, right? And that that has customer protections, trade protections, but, but at, at a maximum fall under regular bank deposit reg regulatory requirements. And most, if not all crypto people are already, you know, lead with transparency and, and honesty. You've got a lot of really, really bad apples. So, I would challenge those groups to meet that mandate and make sure that the regulators get what they need to underwrite it. Yeah. And so, by the way, some would even go further on stable coins and say, look, uh, you know, we have fractional reserve banking here in the U.S., but these are assets that should essentially be held under trust, they would say. So the argument goes. Uh, and so they shouldn't be lent out. These should be, you know, what the, the accounting term, of course, is cash or cash equivalents. Uh, and, um, you know, that's where the whatever tiny yield can be generated from that. Hopefully we get to a point where monetary policy begins to look a little bit more mm -hmm. normalized. Uh, and not uh, ultra accommodative, not uh, sort of this extraordinary policy environment that we've been in the last for 14 years or so. Uh, and that folks who are creating these stable coins can capture that spread uh, between, you know, short term U.S. treasuries or whatever they're holding, whatever the constituency of those assets are uh, and uh, and and, you know, generate revenue that way. That's one of the arguments that's out there, at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to juxtapose the fiat backed right die has done a pretty fantastic job on the collateralization and the maker maker group has you know purchased securities to actually back it and generate interest and then i also think that the By the curves... way, explain that for for folks who are not familiar with the die stablecoin algorithmic because i think that they often uh, these often get lumped into buckets in people's heads uh, for example terra usd and die obviously very different give us a little bit of a back of the envelope explanation on that yeah so terra and, and or luna and UST were basically tied, their fapes were tied together. And there was a burn mechanism that if this did that, then this would happen. So essentially, if we're going to break a peg, you could have a run on. And that's exactly what happened. The network was attacked. There was giant short selling and it broke it and then it just burned everything down. I, so, I we should say attacked financially in terms of short selling, not a, 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 a cryptographic. Not a DDoS attacker. or D, right, exactly. Yes. Go ahead, um, please. So with DAI, it doesn't have any tie to any specific alternate crypto asset, right? And so the supply is kind of managed within a bandwidth, right? And so it's controlled by algorithms that are super tr transparent. And then to back the value, right, as it's grown in, in use and and permeated, the 
group in charge of it has decided to back it with real estate loans, short-term securities to give it an actual asset backing, at least in part. So I think that's a great hybrid of the two. I do think a purely quantum algorithmic stable coin could be pretty impressive. That's mm. five, 10 years out, but uh, I'm excited to see, you know, Curve's release and how, how, they, how they do with that. Uh, by the way, talk a little bit about Curve for people who may not know. Curve's really just a, you know, a DeFi uh, governance token, but the platform itself is a very OG JavaScript looking interface, which we all <laughs> happen to be fans of. And, um, you know, it's a place where you can essentially participate in all of the DeFi uh, lending and, and borrowing services that are available. And it's very, very dynamic. Anybody who's not already in DeFi should, should be checking it out. Yeah, you know, these these conversations are fascinating. I always I am, am very passionate about um, financial innovation. I think it's just an incredible sort of broad constellation of conversations here. On, on the flip side, I, I do I do worry about retail investors. And, you know, for people for people who are listening to this who aren't, uh, you know, Chris and or Haim or uh, Rishi, you know, there is there is risk. There is risk in this. There's also opportunity. It's it's this weird moment where you start to see the infrastructure of the 21st century financial system being built out, and yet we see these spectacular implosions, these incredible collapses. Uh, whether it's you know it's it's FTX uh, or or BlockFi uh, or Celsius or any of the others, so it, it really is this just in, unusual time. I, I had a conversation yesterday. Uh, on this show with uh, Charlie Gasparino over on uh, Fox News, who's who's covered a lot of the uh, implosions and and from literally from the dot com bubble in the late '90s uh, through the financial crisis, and we we were we were talking about this uh, yesterday, and it it just is fascinating to see the 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 opportunity here, and and, and Charlie actually pointed out. The level of retail exposure there was in the collapse uh, in back in uh, the year 2000. I I remember that day. I was working at Credit Suisse uh, private banking here in New York City. I was one of the young kids on Wall Street back in those days, and I I remember going up to the trading floor that day. I didn't. I made up a reason to go up to the trading floor. I didn't have <laughs> to be there, but I was like, I want a mental snapshot in my head of what it looks like uh, when the dream implodes, blows up, or at least, you know, goes into hibernation for a couple of uh, years. And it was, it's just a profound experience that I've never forgotten. And so, you know, you, you think about the the trajectory of, of web 1.0 into web 2.0 and moving into web 3.0 where we are right now. And, and it's so clear that, that that's such a, a secular growth story. And yet, and yet people have lost money. I think Amazon was underwater for something like six years if you <clears> bought the peak in 1999. Yeah, it might have been till 2014, Ash. Uh, if it was I, a I long. Try, it was a long time. I will look it up. I believe the Nasdaq did not. It's either 2014 or 2016. Did not make a new high until till one of those years. Um, you know, I I I wouldn't measure things specifically in making money or not making money. Right, you're you're going to have these repetitive human driven cycles. Either it you know po was industrial right, and then it's been tech revolutions right. What what always leads to those historically? It's speculation right, because you've got people who've got good ideas, they're mm -hmm. passionate, and they want to rush into putting them to work. That's just natural right. So in that process, you're going to have different types of investors right. And then here, while it seems like there's dozens of blowups right that you're you're listing names. They, it all really comes down to two sources, right? You know, the the, the Ter Terra Luna blow up took down the Celsius types and and the Voyager types, and then FTX just blew up everybody else. Genesis, uh, you know, at all. Yeah. All right, sports fans. I just found my super nerdy notes here on it. So <laughs> March of 1999, Amazon peaked at four dollars and thirty cents a share. Split adjusted July of 1999, nearly cut in half to about two fifty a share. November of 1999 came back just below the high of four twenty five per share, and then it plunged down to twenty five cents, down over ninety percent. So there was this drop, and then it rose again, and then plunged. Uh, finally traded over $4.50 a share on September of 2007. So it was underwater for 94 months, uh, nearly 100 <laughs> months, seven years, 10 months, nearly 3,000 days. Max Drawdown lost 95% of its value. High, DEC 99, 534, low, SEP 
$2,129 per share, all split adjusted. What a, what a buying opportunity. Holy cow. Okay, here, I'll play, I'll play devil's advocate again. You're absolutely right. Amazing buying opportunity. You know what it was not a buying opportunity for? Pets.com. Survivors right. bias and sorting this out. And that is one of the things that makes what we do so interesting. And you can always look back in any asset class, in really any strategy or business, like if I did this, I would have made more or would have lost less. Um, so recency bias, confirmation bias, all of that is going to be part of the human experience. So you're exactly right. Like how how was one to know at that point that pets was going to go bye bye and Amazon was going to become a trillion dollar market cap, right? You, you you don't. And that's the risk part of investing. Right. And, Absolutely. You know, we we try to use fancy algorithmic methodologies, whether it's regression or machine learning to try and have some sort of you know forward prediction that has a, a range we can invest confidently in. But that's all you're going to get. Like there's no clairvoyance, you know, unless you're a medium. Um, there's no real prediction that you can make that's that's ironclad right that's not how nature works it's not how humanity works so um you know what what i think is easier in this space for me as an investor especially with assets like ethereum which is now deflationary is i don't have an inflation number that's high single digits high uh, double digits to overcome where it's just speculative price action that will feed the ability to overcome that rate well, Chris, until mediums and the spirit realm start giving us definitive <laughs> answers about the future, the best we can do right now is to ask questions of experts like you. By the way, if you are on YouTube in the chat, if you're on the Real Vision website, drop some questions in uh, for Chris Sullivan. Uh, we've got him here for a little while longer. We want to get some questions. I can see some are already filing in. Uh, Chris, you know, next story here. This is an interesting one. Uh, this is about Australia. We have actually lots of viewers in Australia, so I'm sure the next story will be of particular interest to them. Australia has released a consultation paper on crypto regulation, a topic we've been talking about here today. Uh, as the block notes, the paper avoids a, quote, exhaustive bespoke taxonomy, close quote, of digital assets. Instead, it forms two groups of token systems, intermediated and public. This is interesting, a broad kind of categorization scheme. Crypto service providers would fall under the first category, while smart contracts would fall under the second category, for example. This is something that you and I have talked about extensively before, true decentralization. The government wants to check if some existing regulations could be sufficient for those categories. This comes as India revealed the G20, that's the group of 20 world's largest, excuse me, biggest economies in the world, is working with the IMF on global crypto regulation. Chris, what are your thoughts on this race towards regulating crypto nationally, supranationally, uh, through the G20, through national governments uh, and supranational organizations like the European Union? Uh, that appears to have picked up globally after the collapse of FTX, of course. Well, way to be on time, regulators. Uh, so, you know, I, I've i always been a, a proponent of the rule of law and, and for competent and logistically compliable uh, regulations. Like if it's not easy for me to comply with something or any business, then that means the regu regulatory environment or law is unjustified, right? So I think there are risks that you concentrate the digital asset space to certain jurisdictions that may not be good for the practitioners in the space or the investors. But obviously, it, you know, if you just apply what the CFTC has already said, that's good enough. Now, I, I'm not a regulator. I can't delineate which ones are securities and which aren't, right? But it's very clear decentralized commodities are already governable by existing regulation. So, I think wise and prudent regulation has never protected any investors. So this is certainly reactionary. But I just find it fascinating that for something that's a trillion market cap, all of these governments are talking about it all day and putting out press releases and having the media write all these newsletters, yet almost none of them know what they're talking about. None of them know the taxonomy or, or tokenomics properly. And they're all they have to do is apply some sort of combination of commodity FX and securities regulation and let it go. 
Yeah, you know, it's interesting having this conversation and talking with Charlie Gasparino yesterday. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he said something that I thought was rather interesting. And I'm, I'm going to summarize it. This is my take on his view. But he basically said, hey, listen, stop worrying about whether stuff is or is not a security. That's not what matters here. You know, people who are investing in crypto know that there's risk uh, when they do it. They understand that. Uh, really spend your time focusing, in his view, and on the on the FTXs of the world, on the intermediaries that are not adequately capitalized. They're doing things that would you know, essentially never be permitted in the traditional finance realm. So that was an interesting take. Yeah, that, that's a great take. And I agree completely. Like they're not paying any attention to any of these bridge hacks, Ash, because they don't care if crypto native people lose money in DeFi, right? They're just ticked off that very wealthy people lost money in FTX. So the people that donate to them are now telling them, go do something, right? When, you know, they had plenty of time to under underwrite it um so and, and then let's let's look at that okay let, if they Chris, i'm so i'm so glad you're never cynical <laughs> well the the you know the facts are painful or they really wouldn't be facts right um i'm a facts-based objective uh investor not a narrative driven investor and it's always weight of evidence and the evidence i want to weight is objective evidence right uh but let's look at you know if we apply securities regulations to a T, what does that even harm the space? No, it it emboldens it. And what what do the tokens have to do that would be considered securities? They just have to file properly, that they are issuing a security in their existing regs that they would have to comply with, which most groups are already complying with. So, I, I really think that again, and and we've talked about this, consumer protections through the intermediaries should be the focus not the protocols themselves. Yeah. Um, so here's another story uh, about an institution important to the function of crypto machinery. This is sort of right to the point that we were just talking about. Uh, sources speaking to Bloomberg say crypto-friendly bank Silvergate Capital is under investigation by the U.S. Department of Justice. The investigation relates to Silvergate's dealings with FTX and Alameda Research, obviously both Sam Bankman freed companies. The source says the criminal investigation is examining Silvergate's hosting of accounts tied to Sam Bankman frieds businesses. Bloomberg says the investigation is in an early phase and the bank has not been accused of any wrongdoing. The inquiry might end without any charges being filed. Shares of Silvergate are trading lower today on this news. They had surged on Thursday, but that was erased in after hours trading. The investigation has overshadowed the news that asset manager State Street increased its stake in Silvergate. BlackRock announced a similar move earlier this week. Chris, any thoughts on this? Uh, which part? All of it, top to bottom. What do you think? Right. Um, well, first, there's pretty hellacious short covering rally in Silvergate that was kind of beautiful to see. Um, By the way, Chris, are you are you watching the equities in the space? Are you are you paying attention to the publicly traded companies? Do you see opportunities there? I I you know we're all in on this, so I would argue I do pay attention. But am I massively underwriting everything that you know on the options and equity side? Um, not really. I mean, we definitely because you guys could do that. I mean, you have you have the folks in house where you could make those bets on it if you wanted to put them on. Right. It's just not part of the the fund mandate, but it it could right. be right because some of these are a lot more transparent in terms of how to execute a trade to to win versus crypto. Right. I've I've also seen, and maybe it's me, but I've I've I believe this is just my own back of the envelope staring at prices every day. Is that it, sometimes, particularly when there are when there is negative news flow, it's it seems like the publicly traded equities sell off faster than the digital assets. I I wonder if that's just because people have access to them, right? It's on your trade blotter. If you want a short Coinbase, I'm just just to pick one out of the sky. Yeah, think, oh, right. Boom! We know how to do that. Yeah, we know how to do that. So and you can hit it faster. So it seems like there is some opportunity there to capitalize on on pricing action. Yeah. The the problem with that is that the the correlations they like go in thirds. You know, sometimes it, it trades with precious metals. Sometimes it correlates to the NASDAQ. There, there's not enough data with a high enough correlation to make sort of that ar arbitrage um, monetizable. Certainly, technologically, that's the case. But yeah. a lot of times you, you just have to go with what works. What does work in crypto is a macro money supply model and then it flows. The, those are those have Expl high. Expl explain what that means. For people who have so the, trading the, the correlations that have the highest predictive quality that that we act on and and monitor very heavily are the correlation to 
global money supply and it's really its second its first derivative at the rate of change of that right okay so for, for again for people who don't have macro backgrounds what you're talking about here is is basically the second derivative of the rate of change of central bank policy uh influencing global liquidity flows right well it, ironically here you know with the right the rising rates which is purposely to stop credit creation you still have fiscal creating fiat so we, we've seen a turn and it, it actually started breaking out in, in mid-January of that sort of money supply uh, model. And it's despite higher rates, which is kind of interesting. Um, we're seeing a lot of new types of data and, and new correlations um, where you wouldn't see that coming. Now, the central banks can't do a damn thing about inflation because credit creation does not drive commodity prices, right? Supply chain breaks are, are what's driving that. So. Uh, but back back to the answer that that correlation is very high in crypto, right? It's also pr pretty high in stocks too. Um, the other one that we like is is li literal money flow. We you can measure that in a million different ways. There are money flow indicators like the MFI. There are Orderbrook Alpha indicators that we build and use internally, so that if new money is flowing on exchange, there's new wallets and there are new buy side volumes, then it's going to go higher. Here we have this huge move that's occurred on a short time span. What is the root cause of that? Well, tons of Bitcoin being pulled off exchange, tons of Ethereum being staked. You just have a literal lack of supply and a very you know apparent condition of all the selling has occurred. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I, I probably... Uh, said global central bank liquidity flows as, as making it implying that it was causative, but uh, the reality is it's part of these these broader financial conditions. I, I was just getting a tweet uh, this morning from Cross Border mm -hmm. Capital. That's Mike Howell's shop, uh, mm -hmm. talking about some global liquidity flow information. So financial conditions can expand and contract depending also on the on the supply and demand of funds. In addition to the significant driver, of course, which is central bank uh, policy. Um, speaking of global stories, here I wanted uh, to do a story. Uh, in Asia, which is an interesting one on my screen here today, Binance is re-entering South Korea. Binance Holding has acquired a local troubled crypto exchange uh, called GoPax. Binance had exited South Korea two years ago. The investment was made through the Industry Recovery Fund, which Binance set up in the wake of the FTX collapse. GoPax halted withdrawals in November in its DeFi service because of the liquidity issues at Genesis, the now bankrupt crypto lender. Uh, Chris, uh, one company's misfortune is another's opportunity, perhaps, uh, especially in this market. I'm curious if you have any uh, specific thoughts either on the South Korea market or more broadly on these types of opportunities where you see, uh, you know, you see a company uh, essentially shutting down a, a, a lender, DeFi protocol or platform uh, as a consequence of their back end liquidity provider, for example, uh, in this case, Genesis filing for bankruptcy. It's unfortunate because I would argue that you should never do that. Right. So if it's six cents on the dollar that you can let out, let that six cents out. Um, Ex expl explain that what you mean by that. Me meaning so if their exposure to Genesis was 94 percent and because Genesis did a, a lot of other shady things and went went under or or just over levered to the wrong people that that's that could have happened innocently, too. Then you have that remaining six cents of capital. Let that be acted upon and if people want to withdraw it let them withdraw it I, I really don't like and it's certainly not part of the crypto uh mantra and thesis of the space to wall off investors from their capital or projects right you forget that a lot of projects have investments as well and they need they need on and off ramps and they're using a combination of cfi and, and tradfi institutions and and defi um pools to utilize their capital like we can't keep relying on intermediaries to give us access to our own money. Like it's, let me it's, let me try and explain this for people, at least as best as I understand it. You can correct me if I'm wrong. You're talking sure. about essentially this this kind of paradigm shift uh, from the world of traditional finance, where when typically you see these these problems uh, at, a, at a fund or some other financial intermediary or entity, the tendency uh, we've seen in the past many times is for the the folks who are running that institution <laughs> or that fund to say, okay, we're gating. 
uh, we're gating redemptions. And that is a fancy way of saying, hey, you can't take your money out. And the reason for that is they're they're presumably saying, hey, listen, if these withdrawals will have a negative impact on our liquidity position, it will have a negative impact on our ability to meet future redemptions. So let's gate it. What you're saying here is an interesting point because it's just the opposite. Basically, in this DeFi world, hey, when there's a when there's a challenge, if it's a 94 percent uh, loss, 94 cents on the dollar, let people take their six cents out, give people a sense of uh, liquidity in it and start moving toward a world that looks more uh, like a, a truly decentralized system uh, where they're not human beings who are making judgment calls based on what they think is best, but rather execution that happens autonomously based on code that's publicly available that everyone knows, that everyone can see and review and let the chips fall where they may. It's almost like we need a decentralized smart contract platform. I mean, <laughs> you're, you're, you hit the nail on the head. Like, let's look at we should do another show on just DeFi performance during this pretty pretty giant bear market. Yes, because smart contracts have just crushed. And I'm not a very I'm a contrarian bear as a human being, right? So I don't get too excited about feeling good because that's not a normal feeling. But I was blown away <laughs> by the performance of this. And then to like to see that there are improvements on understanding how these bridges are hacked so we can further limit those because there's way too much of that occurring okay. and that's in part because of ui ux being so hard even for practitioners like like me where you know whether our you know we use a combination of metamask trust wallet ledger so many different things just to do one function it's very hard and laborious to get to the point where you're competent in it right and so you have to be one part blockchain developer one part software developer one part technologist one part trader all in one just to not lose your money it's not an easy thing for the public to overcome yeah uh, by the way chris i should say uh my producer is pinging me right now telling me we've got lots of questions lots of people so Bring maybe this will make you feel good I i'm here let's do it okay so before we get to viewer questions for those of you watching on the real vision website thank you if you haven't signed up there yet check it out realvision.com that's the best way to get early access to real vision content and it's always free today we've released the latest rouse adventures in crypto he spoke with chief fintech officer of fin of singapore's monetary authority this is a pretty cool conversation around talking with uh, the head of singapore's uh, central bank uh, the chief fintech officer of uh, singapore's central bank uh, find out how the government is thinking about bitcoin in singapore other cryptocurrencies and the blockchain in depth Plus, if you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. We really do appreciate it. Uh, and hit the notification bell. Okay, on to viewer questions. Uh, the first one comes to us from the Real Vision website. Uh, it's from Timothy L. Uh, what do you want to see out of Bitcoin, Chris, to have a high conviction the next bull run has begun? Cheers. Great question. I'm sure a lot of people are curious about it. What I want to see I think what he's asking is, uh, and I'm, I'm just my my take on it. And I think he's saying, what sort of indicators do you want to see uh, from a price uh, perspective, from a technical perspective, that we are officially in a bull run in Bitcoin? I think that's the spirit. Okay, of the yeah, great, great question. Because right now it's we could be in a bull run, right? So yeah. I, I combine a mix of subjective awareness of his history of cycles with the doctrinal objective sort of TA and quant, right? Objectively, what do we need to see? And I, I saw Peter Brandt got hammer timed for mentioning double walled fulcrum pattern and people like, oh, he made up the pattern name. That's an old school point figure pattern. And he's absolutely correct. So that was a robust bottoming pattern. The the MVRV bottomed broke out, well, multiple bottom broke out. So the, the on-chain indicators are confirming the price action, volumes confirming price action. What we need to see is a, a good old fashioned retest and a, a print of a higher low, um, and, and then how forceful that next breakout is. What is definitely the first clue here for a robust new uptrend, whether it be more like a 19 type of uptrend or what nobody's kind of expecting, which would be funny if it happens, a giant chop range of like 45 to 20, which no one can predict the future. That's that's possible. And we have not seen that yet in crypto, a giant sort of box, right? Um, so what I would be first to highlight for everybody here is that we just made obscene overbought conditions. Historically, that's a good indication of a change of trend. 
right? If you look at the bear market rallies that occurred in 18, and then most recently, the, the two in uh, August and then a little bit in October, those were met with very low daily overbought conditions, not really getting uh, too much follow through there and kind of met the momentum at the price high. Where here, you've got a classic momentum divergence while there's a consolidation and a grinding higher. So mm-hmm. I'd like to... S- I'd just like to see how the next pullback looks, have traditional MAs kind of hold what crypto usually wicks them to fake everybody out. And I would anticipate because sentiment's only kind of at the midpoint, you probably see a pretty big bear trap that occurs if we are going to kick off into a full-fledged bull market. Define bear trap for people who don't know the term. When bears bet against the first rally of a trend and get their you know what's handed to them because they're wrong and typically like because here we've got a monthly bar that's absolutely enormous and engulfs months of price action right you're going to retrace that you know 0. 0.382 0. 0.5 0. 0.618 one, one of those is going to happen right uh historically the first retracement is going to be brutal and it's going to fake people out to think that the trend change watch the news go oh see back in bear market and that's how the bears get trapped mm. Chris, we, we really do have the best viewers, the best viewer questions. These are just so insightful. Here's one that comes to us from Ralph H., one of our regular viewers here. Is it more accurate to describe stable coins as money market funds rather than euro dollar deposits? Interesting question. I think you were picking up on the regulatory component of uh, euro dollars, but he's asking, is it sort of a more of a money market fund? Well, no, because, well, yes and no. If it's a money market fund, then it's definitely security. Um, but with because <laughs> you have shares of a money market fund and that it, the share is the security. So you could you could definitely um, say that they are related. I'm, I'm not a lawyer, nor am I a regulator, so I don't know if I would classify them as such. I personally, as a trader and investor, do not view stables as a place where I'm rotating to to hide out. I only do more Bitcoin for that purpose. Um, so I, I think you can have that view. But is it? Is it and should it be classified as such? No. Great question. Great answer. All right. Here's a fun one from YouTube from Gareth Sims. He's trolling you a little bit, Chris. Bitcoin is not a stable coin. It has no stability against the dollar. <laughs> okay. It's up 23,000% while the dollar's gone down. So, okay. <laughs> You're wrong. All right. So to Gareth's point, I think what he's saying essentially is, you know, you, most of us uh, here in the United States in 2023 owe our outflows uh, in U.S. dollars. I cannot pay the tax man in Bitcoin. Uh, <laughs> there is always that risk of a decline. And go ahead. I want to re-answer that and not be so mean. Uh, what was the what was the YouTuber's name? Gareth Sims. Gareth, when I mean stable coin, I mean an asset that has some of the best code ever written that embodies property rights that will not be eroded by either an unelected group of bureaucrats in in charge of monetary policy or an elected group of bureaucrats burning my money and creating unpaybackable amounts of debt. In that regard, it is absolutely a stable store of value for my hard earned labor, similar to gold and silver and other precious metals, similar to real estate. It is an asset uh, that is a store of value. And then mathematically, it's literally up 23,000, what is it, 23, four, something like that today, percent since inception, while the dollar has just gone down. And since 1913, dollars down 98 plus percent, therefore only leaving another two of purchasing power and is not a stable asset to, to leave your labor in, period. It's the kinder, gentler Chris Sullivan. See, Gareth, we're nice here at Religion. By the way, it's always funny to me, and it doesn't matter whether you're watching Fox News or MSNBC, if you want to just like, you want to get broad agreement on something, just beat up on Congress. Everybody agrees with that. Unfortunately, like none of them are qualified except for like five people. So (laughs) it's sad. Anyways, that's not a productive use of our time. More questions, please. (laughs) Steve M. on the Real Vision website. Hi, Ash. I'm curious as to the guest thought on what effect, if any, the minting of NFTs on the BTC network will have? Interesting question. Very interesting. That's ordinals. Um, I don't think we have enough data yet on it. I like layer two solutions on top of Bitcoin because I like the blockchain. I'm a proof of work fan in general because that's labor into code. Um, literally energy is is the value put into proof of work. So, um, you know, I, I would argue it's right now cute, 
and it's a free market. Anybody can buy, bid and ask on whatever assets they want on top of it. I don't think it's going to congest anything. So for, for me, it's it should be accretive. I, I don't think there's any sort of value that's going to translate to the Bitcoin blockchain, although it's nice to see things built on top of it. Yeah, and 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 that has been, I think, a, a process that's been slower than some people would like, just being honest about it. But that's the nature of Bitcoin. Bitcoin uh, moves very slowly, and it moves very slowly because the thing that Bitcoin does is it secures transactions on the blockchain, and it has to be uh, in the view of the Bitcoin core developers. It's got to be 100% or they don't do it. Uh, and that's just the that's just the nature of uh, of the beast. And so I think it's an interesting point. Uh, another question from uh, from YouTube, RV on YT. Uh, what about the regulation risk for Ethereum? Oh boy, this is a great question, and I know something you're interested in for the smart contract space. Yeah. It's holding me back. And he says he goes on to say, I'm just going to read a little bit more here. It's holding me back from investing significantly. If ETH is declared security by the SEC, what will the future course of action be uh, for ETH and its ecosystem? Great question. Another one. Yeah, it's solid. And I would throw on one more risk is like what what um, ERC tokens would then be subject to any factor regulatory actions. Um, you know, a lot of that's being, explain what that means. Oh, man. Um, it means that you're in violation of KYC AML esque. And we right. determine you aren't you can't have you know, US investor capital, basically. And by, and by um, the way, this is a this is a topic that's, <laughs> that's interested me before the collapse of FTX. I was calling this the biggest story in the space. It's this weird, immovable object versus unstoppable force when you have, you know, what happens when you have and, th and this is a question I'm, I'm sure we're not going to answer here today. But you know, what happens when you have a publicly traded entity uh, whose uh, officers and directors are U.S. persons, live in the United States, subject to U.S. law, and you get a transaction uh, on the blockchain that's censored by, by the OFAC list? You have a specially designated national who isn't allowed to conduct that transaction. What do they do? Do they include the transaction? I don't think they can include the transaction because they're clearly in violation of federal law if they do, at least in terms of those interpreting the law today. Uh, and they can't not because they slash it. I know that there's this sort of almost like pre-processing element in the right. way the pools are aggregated. But to your point, Chris, this is a material concern. It is. And then and then because it's so decentralized, and it'll be even more so when we get to um, the Shanghai up, up, upgrade in March, you, you would think process-wise, okay, Ethereum Foundation would register the necessary securities legal documentation to register properly. But then, <clears throat> okay, does that... Uh, is the SEC at all going to say, oh, everybody that owns Ethereum is now compliant with the new filing? It, it is extremely complex. So to be in, in, in one part on the regulator seat, if I'm them, I'm going, oh, my God, I can't just slap securities regulation in, in, in on every asset, only on the ones that I can actually deem are securities. Ethereum, to me, is a commodity. So you've... They've got to actually go through the taxonomy, and then I would look at the tokenomics because tokenomics speak to me as an investor, and I can identify which what assets actually security by by the tokenomics, right? Where oh, you're inducing me to participate in the network to such a degree that I think you've issued a security, right? Versus, you know, what are clearly commodities? Yeah, but by the way, just just one point. It was one that I raised on the air yesterday, uh, September 30, 2019, uh, <laughs> SEC. Uh, levied a penalty on a uh, block one it was a 24 million dollar fine for an un unregistered ico uh, obviously that was a small fraction of what they raised so there there's also this idea that you know maybe maybe or this is theoretical obviously we're talking about the future maybe there's this framework for a kind of you know pay the toll for past behavior if you if you did an ico in a way that uh, sec wasn't comfortable with and you know it's not a it's not a death sentence it's kind of a it's kind of a misdemeanor in the uh, general framework. That, that's one potential outcome uh, for Ethereum, obviously different political environments, so who knows at this point, but it's something that has happened in the past. In fact, it happened uh, four years ago in 20. Well, and, and, and then you've already got 100% of the float out, out there, right, because it's deflationary, so you can't do a look back and apply regulation back, you know, to 2014, for example, in, in Ethereum's case. So I, I think for tokens that have 70 plus percent of issuance that are currently liquid, that presents a safer opportunity from a regulatory risk perspective. But back to the, the earlier question, the the very risk that he or she is citing is why all the institutions are not all in this space, which is mm. why there's asymmetry. So you, you just have to allocate uh, the amount that you feel good with that you're, you know, going to be like, hey, I own at least this much of Ethereum. And then when and if it all gets resolved and it's 
whatever thousand it is, you'd be happy. Chris, I could do this all day. We've got so many great questions here, but I've got to end on this one uh, from the Real Vision website. It's Richard D. Boy, this one's a hardball. Here's the question. <laughs> happy, happy Friday. Great talk. Love the art, Chris. Who is the artist? Um, the artist is kind of unknown. We got it in a, uh, a Sanford-based regional bank that was banking Bitcoin ATMs back in the day. It's of Pipeline in Hawaii. Um, yeah. It's oil on canvas. It is beautiful, but w the, the artist's signature is missing. It just says Romero. It's missing anything else on there. We've looked it up. Can't find him or her. Um, so, but thank you. Yeah, I, I'm a big surfer, so I like sitting sitting here. And it was our COO, uh, Matthew Rosen, who bought it for me. So that was nice. nice. And so our viewers know that I do not traffic in conspiracy theories here on this show. But what if, Chris, Satoshi is Romero, Romero is Satoshi? Uh, how finny. Huh, what? <laughs> um, you know, great. Uh, cool. Both are cool names. So... Yes, indeed. Chris, this is an absolutely spectacular show. We should get you on every Friday. Terrific show. We've covered a lot of ground here today. Final thoughts, key takeaways that you'd like to leave our audience with. You know, live to fight another day, right? And I think looking at the last three years, right, whether it's gaslighting, mass formation, psychosis, uh, propaganda, abuse, physically, mentally, et cetera, with trading and investing, try and always act as simply and methodically and process driven as possible. If you are a long term investor in this space, does it matter? Ask yourself, does it matter if it goes to 26.5, peaks out here, goes to 20? Does that matter to you? Does it matter that it takes off to 30 and you're not in? Understand how you want to be allocated to the space before allocating or while you're allocating and come up with a trade plan. If you're trying to day trade to wealth, I promise you, you're going to lose, and so you should not do that. Uh, but if you're going to take a long-term view, there's enough research. Real Vision is one of the best financial news networks and data networks on earth, if not the best. Uh, and and just mine their data to find what you want to invest in, and then underwrite it. And if if it's a trade versus an investment, it just increases your your likelihood of being unsuccessful. Well, Chris, we really appreciate that. And it's, it is, Real Vision is what it is because of guests like you. Uh, thank you so much for coming on and joining us again. It's always a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you. Uh, this episode of Crypto Daily Briefing is sponsored by the Crypto App. The Crypto App is your place for all things crypto. Download the Crypto App today on Google Play or iOS App Store. That's it for today. We'll be back on Monday. Guests will include people from Starkware, Radix, and Arca. See you Monday at 9 a.m. Pacific Time, noon Eastern, 5 p.m. London, live on Real Vision Crypto Daily Briefing. Have a great weekend, everybody.